Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. You know, we do these programs, these living history programs quite often, but there's always a special excitement when you have an assassination eyewitness. There's an electricity in the room that's just palpable. Uh, it's almost like a survivor of the Titanic. It's, it's touching someone who was touched by history, and uh, we're very grateful that Mary could be here and share her story today. Our ongoing oral history project is, is dynamic and ever-growing, and if you'd like to add your personal perspective, no matter where you were in the world or how old you may have been, in 1963, we believe that everyone has a story to share from that weekend. If you'd like to participate, you can contact us via our website at jfk.org, and you can be part of this tapestry of living history that we will be continuing to grow in the future. Mary, I want to get started today with uh, your career. You joined the staff of Women's News at the Dallas Morning News in 1961, right out of college, right? right out of college. And Women's News in those days was typically not considered hard news, but this was the beginning of a, of a transition. Over at your competition, the Dallas Times-Herald, Vivian Castleberry was sort of leading the charge for women to cover hard news stories. Right. But, but you were, were covering what in, in the early 60s? Oh, we did lots of weddings, club news, debutante parties, and of course food. Mm -hmm. We had it every Thursday was a food section. We have on the screen here uh, one of your, you, you had a series called Penny Watcher, Penny Watcher <laughs> Menus, and this is one that has your byline, and you can see from the date at the top, it's Monday, November 25th, 1963, so uh, this is actually the day of the Kennedy funeral, but tell us a little bit about, about the Penny Watcher series, because I've, I've seen quite a few of these with your byline. Well, actually, Julie Bunnell, which some of you may have heard of, she was a very well-known person in those days, had a TV show. And uh, I was the person who got assigned to handle most of her newspaper. Every Thursday was a food section. And I somehow got along with well with Julie. And so I got assigned to doing most of the food sections. And that's how I happened to be doing the penny watchers menu. Uh, Julie Bunnell was famously on the air live when uh, WFAA Channel 8 broke in with news of the assassination. That's what I've heard, yeah. yes. And, and you mentioned to me earlier a little, a little tidbit <clears throat> that I had not heard before that had you stayed at the morning news that you may have eventually replaced Julie on the air, is that right? Well, I, at least as food editor, I don't know if the, the uh, show would have gone with it, but uh, yes, because I did, I did all her newspaper work, really, yeah. at that point. Now, you did cover one hard news story not long after you joined the staff in 1961, and we have a, a great picture of it that you, you provided to us. Tell us what's happening in this picture. Well, I think that was my first, I'm pretty sure it was my very first week on the job, fresh out of college, and a plane was hijacked to Cuba, and they wanted to get on the phone to Castro. Well, there was nobody in the entire Dallas News except this week-long graduate who spoke <laughs> Spanish. So I was I'm on the phone to Cuba trying to get a hold of uh, Castro. Never got a hold of him, talked to a lot of people in the office, but we couldn't get through to him. But anyhow, that was the picture. Uh, the interest, I think, is to think of how few Spanish-speaking people there were on staff in those days and here I'm not at all Spanish but I was the only one who spoke Spanish. It's a shame that your talents were wasted on wedding announcements and debutante balls because you were quite politically savvy in those days. You had attended the Democratic National Convention in 1960 yes. and, and met President Kennedy or Senator Kennedy at the time. Tell me a little bit about, as a young woman, what was the appeal of John F. Kennedy in the early 60s? Well, I think part of it was his youth. There was a certain glamour to him. He wasn't like the usual old politicians we were used to. But actually, he was not my choice in 1960. I had not gone there supporting John Kennedy. I went there supporting still my lifelong idol, Adlai Stevenson. Right. We're going to talk about Stevenson in a few moments. But uh, looking at this wonderful picture of the Kennedys, and of course this was taken at Dallas Love Field that, that day, November 22nd, uh, we remember Kennedy through black and white pictures like this. You got to meet him more than once. What was it like to be in his presence? Well, he was total charm, absolute charm and uh, very vibrant, easy to talk to, very easy to talk to. 
when we talk about uh, November 22nd, you weren't necessarily, even though you were a Kennedy supporter, a Kennedy kid, as you described yourself, you weren't necessarily planning to go see the parade that day because you had already met him. Right. I, he was just going to be going by in a car, and I'd actually talked to him in person, so I didn't really need to go see him. But I had never seen Jackie Kennedy. Right. Uh, in fact, at the convention, which I had attended, she was very pregnant with uh, John John and wasn't even at the convention. So I wanted to see Jackie, was why I went. Tell us a little bit about Jackie's influence in terms of fashion and hairstyle in those days. Oh, well, we all wanted to be like Jackie, you know. Most of us couldn't quite make it like me, but uh, she was, you know, we all aspired to be like Jackie. Mm -hmm. Would you have uh, been a campaign volunteer in 64? Well, Kennedy? the thing of it is that was my problem working for the newspaper. There was a very strict policy that you couldn't be politically involved. So that was one of my dilemmas because that was a big interest of mine. But all the time I was working at the news, I was not involved in politics and probably could, would not have been in 64. Of course, by the time 64 election came around, I had already left. Now, editorially, the Dallas Morning News was very conservative. Very conservative, And, and yes. you are a self-described liberal. So yes. how did that work on a day-to-day -day basis with your coworkers? Well, because, of course, in the women's news, we weren't really involved in the political things. And I had a lot of good friends. The person who some of you may remember, Ann Donaldson Atterbury, who was eventually the society editor of the Dallas Morning News, was my roommate. So I had a lot of good friends. And Aurelia Alonzo, who was also one of the four of us who... Uh, witnessed the assassination she was a she was she and i were the two liberal democrats on the right. staff now that morning of course the, the the there was a paid advertisement in the dallas morning news we've talked about this before yes. the full page yes. incendiary ad uh, welcoming kennedy to dallas but actually criticizing him how did you feel that morning were you concerned at all about his safety because of this political hostility no, I really wasn't. I just, you know, I guess it was naivete, but I, it just never crossed my mind to be worried about it. Now, you were present there in Dallas at Municipal, or excuse me, Memorial Auditorium on October 26, 1963, less than a month before the assassination. You, Adlai Stevenson, who's not in this photograph, but this gives you a sense of um, the heated debate going on that night at Memorial Auditorium. You were there for United Nations Day. It became a very important factor after the assassination as people around the globe sort of characterized Dallas politically yes. as a hostile environment. What was it like to be there at Memorial Auditorium that night for the Stevenson speech? Well, of course, it was it was very difficult because I was a great admirer of Stevenson and, of course, thinking it very unfair and very unlike what I thought American political activity was like. I mean, it was the first time I had run into that and I had been somewhat involved in politics. I, I worked in my first election when I was 12 years old. Mm. Uh, for, for folks who may not be familiar with what actually happened that night, give us a sense of what you observed personally. Well, I just observed that um, this huge crowd and people were heckling and just very rude. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looked on the verge of being dangerous. I don't think anybody actually did get really truly hurt, but it was not a pleasant, it was an ugly scene. And it was broadcast, of course, locally, and, yes. and, and so it, it yes. was well documented, and yes. when Stevenson left the auditorium, he was hit on the head with a sign, and yes. uh, again, this, for so many people, after the assassination of President Kennedy, this event in October that you were present for right. took on such meaningful significance. Well, there have been lots of things, you know, there have been all that stuff with General Walker, mm -hmm. too, as right. you remember, so the, the uh, I guess the ambiance was not good. But I still just never, never crossed my mind that something like this could happen. So there were four of you from the Women's News Department that came down to Dealey Plaza. Why did you choose that location on the north side of Elm? Well, we were going to stop right in Dealey Plaza, but it was too crowded. So we looked around in, on, um, in front of the school, but you paused turned down it. The crowds were very thin, so we thought we would get a better look. So we came around the corner mm -hmm. and down the street. And you were in the, the eye line of a dress manufacturer named Abraham Zapruder. And as a result of that, Mary, you are in one of the most famous home movies of the 20th century. We're going to zoom in now so we can point you out. Um, this is you, and I'll, I'll highlight you here. This is you wearing the light gray. Is it a wool suit you're wearing that day? Yeah, well, it was a wool, yes, a light gray wool dress that okay. I took to the cleaners afterwards and for some reason never picked up. Oh, my I don't goodness. know if there's anything... Um, 
psychological about that, but I never picked that dress up. How interesting. And so standing next to you, we have, uh, this is Aurelia Alonzo, another Women's News staff member, and then uh, right here on the right of you, uh, slightly behind you, is Ann Donaldson Atterbury, right. which you mentioned earlier, and then Maggie Smith on Maggie the far Maggie Kennedy, Maggie Brown Kennedy. Maggie Brown Kennedy, excuse me, on the far right here. So the four of you right there on the north side, and you can see there's President Kennedy at the start, uh, towards the beginning of the Zapruder film, so you can see how close you were uh, to that moment in history. And we'll look at several frames here. Mary, take us back 52 years. What do you remember from that moment at 1230? Well, m the first thing I remember is uh, we wanted, they had turned the corner and it was like the parade was over. They were about to hit the freeway and uh, there wasn't a big crowd. There was people, but not huge crowds that they had coming through Dallas. And they were kind of talking amongst themselves in the car. <laughs> And I yelled out, please look this way, because I wanted to see Jackie Kennedy. Please look this way. And they did look at us and waved. And I think we're the last people they waved to. Yeah, you can, you can sort of see that moment in the September yeah. film when the president raises his hand. And then after they, when did, when did the shooting begin? What well, then the shooting, there was one shot. And I have never, always believed it didn't hit anybody, and I think a lot of research has shown I'm probably right on this, because I couldn't see anything happen, and I couldn't figure out what it was, and we were saying, is it, you know, we thought it was somebody backfiring a car, or fireworks or something, but then the next two shots came very, very rapidly. The sound of one didn't kind of fade away before the second shot came, and that's when the second shot I saw really what happened and I don't know of all the four of us it seemed I was the only one who really saw or really understood what happened and I don't know whether it's because they really weren't that intent looking they weren't the Kennedy aficionados that I were was so I don't know if they really just weren't looking because it was also ending you know it was mm -hmm. about to go up on the thruway or they just didn't grasp it I don't know but we got back to the newspaper we delayed a few minutes and before we get to that though I want to I want to talk for just another moment about Dealey Plaza here uh, prior to the motorcade coming through looking around you actually noticed the grassy knoll Tell I did that. I noticed the grassy knoll and I remarked to my friend there there didn't seem to be any kind of protection up there I would have expected there would have been we would have seen police or somebody up there and I remarked I said there doesn't seem to be anybody secure any kind of security up there that would be you know if somebody wanted to do something that a great place and lo and behold of course when something happened my mind flashed to that too now during the shooting were you focused on the car were you looking around no I was focused on the car that's okay. why I think of the four of us I'm the one who really saw what happened and the first shot pause and then the the the, the second two were almost right on top of yes, each other yes okay that's such an important point for researchers to sort of space out the, the shots. And you only heard three, no doubt in your mind. I, there's no doubt. I've never had a single doubt about that. Okay. When the third shot struck the president, you saw what happened. Describe that to well, us. Well, I saw the president sort of fall forward and down. And I saw Jackie, of course, climbing out of the car. And that was scaring me to death, too, because I thought she was going to, you know, fall out. Mm -hmm. And then the Secret Service came running up and pushed her back. And, and then the car tore off. Now you have described the atmosphere in Dealey Plaza as chaos. Tell us a little bit about right well, after it happened. It was interesting because I guess, I don't know, I'm not sure chaos is the right word. People were just stunned. I, I would have thought maybe in something like that people would have been running around and you know scared for themselves or whatever running all directions screaming and yelling. It actually became very quiet and there were people you know just kind of hanging on there in fact we did we just stood there for a few minutes and there were people crying and but there wasn't any like hysteria like anybody was afraid they were going to be hit or something mm -hmm. it's like you know they've done their job and <laughs> that's it but um it was i thought it was odd because i would have expected kind of hysteria and it wasn't at all did the four of you speak to any other eyewitnesses or police um, officers no time? no we walked back to the newspaper and um, for people who know where the newspaper is located, you can actually look out the window mm -hmm. and, and see Dealey Plaza. And uh, so they had heard the commotion and knew something had gone on, but until we walked in 
and told them they didn't know exactly what had happened. And uh, I would kept telling them they, they killed him, they killed him, and nobody would back me up. Yeah. You know, so uh, they finally decided, well, let's take a chance and have her write the story anyway. So they had me write the story before he was pronounced dead or anything. Before we leave Dealey Plaza, I want to hear from Ann Atterbury, who was your roommate at yes. the time, later maid of honor in your wedding. Yes, right. right. Um, Ann uh, did an oral history with the museum in 2003. She sadly passed away in 2009, but we're so grateful to have her eyewitness account. So let's take just a moment and listen. Since they were standing side by side, it's so, so interesting to compare eyewitness accounts. So let's take a listen to what Ann Atterbury had to say about this moment. Well, no, I, I, to start with, I had just seen the Manchurian Candidate, and that was sort of my state of mind. That, that otherworldly movie type of setup in my psyche. Uh, they came by. I did not to see the Connellys except in passing. I was so enthralled with uh, Kennedy and his wife. They he kind of pushed his hair out of his face and smiled and waved what I thought was personally at me right here. They started on down the hill and then I heard a loud noise that I thought might have been a car backfiring or firecrackers or something and I looked up at the tall buildings which is where it sounded like it came from behind me and up uh, by Dealey Plaza up that way. Uh, turned back to the car and heard two more shots and saw him fall. I didn't see the bullets hit him or anything like that. I was so busy trying to track the sound from back kind of behind me. I was facing more toward the triple underpass. And then suddenly I saw people hitting the ground down in that direction and motorcycle uh, police escort motorcycle scoot across the road and there was a pause in the presidential car and then it just sped up and, and went on out of sight. Oh, when I turned back around and saw him fall, there was no doubt that he had been shot. My roommate, uh, Mary Elizabeth, apparently did see the shot hit his head because she said they've killed him and I kept saying oh I hope not I you know surely not surely this is just all bad movie stuff bad dream stuff and she kept saying well they have certainly shot him and I could certainly concur with that and no uh, we started back to the paper crying because there was no doubt in our minds that he had been shot and maybe killed. Mm. So, so Anne certainly remembers you being the most uh, assertive of the group as far as knowing that the right, president was yeah, shot. Right, yeah, I was, I had no doubt. Yeah. You went back to the news and someone gave you a tranquilizer. Yes. The answer to everything. Uh, and this was before you wrote the story. So yes. when, when you wrote the story, which was published in the Dallas Morning News, you were under the influence of a tranquilizer. I guess. I, uh, I don't know how long it takes them to work. <laughs> I'm not really into that. But, uh, yeah. I, and, and such a remarkable eyewitness account because you were typing this up before you knew the president had died. Oh, well, I, I knew he had died. Right, Nobody before else. the official announcement. Yeah, before the official announcement. Now, you mentioned something in here about where you think the shots came from. Tell us about that, because that's become a point of controversy. Well, yes, this is what um, has troubled me ever since in various ways. But I said the shots sounded to have come from behind me and to my right, which would have been the grassy knoll. Now... First of all, I have a hearing problem I've had all my life, and my husband, anybody who knows, can tell you, if I hear a siren or I'm driving, I don't know where it is, I panic, I can't tell the direction of sound. I've also had a number of people, including my brother, who was an expert in firearms, say that the, no the way of land there disturbs sound. But I knew that it had come from the back because I saw where it hit, but I don't know why. I said that it sound because it, in my mind that's what it had sounded like, but I knew he'd been hit in the back. Mm -hmm. So that got me in trouble, and that every nut in the world wanted to get me as the I was called the dissenting witness. Right. And uh, I mean that was actually a label given me, the dissenting witness. And I tried to correct that, 
and then they accused me of, oh, I mean, it's all kinds of Dallas Morning News had paid me off and, you know, all kinds of stories. It's it certainly haunted you. I know in lists that you find online and in books, you're consistently to this day listed among Grassy Knoll eyewitnesses who yes. felt the shots came from the Grassy Knoll. And, and it actually it got worse because in December of 1963, you were interviewed by the FBI. Now, you remember when this interview occurred. You had gone to the hairdresser? Tell yes, us about that. Yes. I had, well, my lunch hour, I went to, the, and now, you know, I'm this young kid, and I went to the hairdresser on my lunch hour, and I came back, and here at the Dallas Morning News, sitting out in front of my office, is, is somebody from the, I think, I may be a little mistaken in the offices, but like FBI, uh, Secret Service, CIA, <laughs> and they're all waiting to interview me, you know, with this little nobody at the paper sitting out in a row to interview me. But thank goodness you had just gotten your hair done. Yes, thank goodness. I, although they didn't take a picture. <laughs> now, this, this FBI uh, report, which you didn't write, it was written by the agents who interviewed right. you. It's dated December 7th, and this is... Uh, intrigued researchers, particularly Mark Lane, made use of this, I think, shortly uh -huh. after it was done. And, and there's a segment I, that I want to mention that, that, is, that has become so controversial. Um, her first reaction was the shots had been fired from above uh, her head and from possibly behind her. Her next reaction was that the shots might have come from the overpass, which was to her right. And as you just described, it, it's just a matter of hearing and echoes and things right. like that. But Mark Lane, because of this statement, really pursued you, right? Oh, he pursued me literally for years. I mean, probably eight and ten years later. I was, I mean, I don't even know how he found me because that time I'd lived abroad, moved to New York, and he somehow could track me down. And I don't know whatever happened to Mark Lane. He must have died because I stopped. No, doing he's it. still around. Is he still around? <laughs> he is. He oh is. Mark Lane uh, was one of the first critical researchers of the assassination. Wrote the best-selling book *Rush to Judgment*, and uh, that's who we're talking about. You were also later on uh, contacted by Jim Garrison's office during his investigation in uh, New he's Orleans. He's another one that tried to get me for years to come. And you were re reluctant to talk to these folks. Oh, well, I was very reluctant, especially to talk to those that I thought were pursuing something that I didn't feel was right. Mm -hmm. And I certainly didn't want to have anything to do with Jim Garrison, who in my mind I had chalked up as a complete nut. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, now, most people who have heard your name associated with the Kennedy assassination know you from a very famous British documentary called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. And I see the way you react when I mention that <laughs> name. Um, it's a very brief segment, but, but that segment is important because it does characterize you, as we've discussed, as a, a grassy knoll eyewitness. But there's another aspect of the story that, that is brought out in that appearance in The Men Who Killed Kennedy, saying that your Dallas Morning News story was pulled from circulation because of the way you described the shot. No, I don't, I don't know that that's true at all. It is true that it was pulled. But I have no idea. I, I don't really know the reason why. In fact, I didn't even know that for quite a long time because I'd just seen it in the first edition, mm -hmm. and I never checked further, and I didn't even realize that until some time later, and I don't know why they did. Do you I think they might have gotten nervous about because here I was this, you know, untrained kid, and... Mm -hmm. So now, the story only ran that one time in the right. paper. Okay. Uh, do you regret doing The Men Who Killed Kennedy? That, uh, that documentary? Oh, yes, indeed, I do. It, it's, it, it's uh, you know, people around the world have seen that, and that's it how they came to know It is constantly on television. You can find it almost every week. I live down in Mexico part of the year now, and they see it down there. I have er, almost every week somebody comes up to me, oh, I saw you on TV last night, you know, and I just cringe every time I hear it. When the filmmakers of that documentary approached you, uh, uh, you've mentioned to me before that you felt like they weren't. Uh, well, first they of didn't all, fully describe the project. Well, to you. first of all, I had this very mistaken impression, which I'm sure maybe a lot of you share, that the BBC was just above reproach. You know, I thought they were the gold standard. And when this, and then Nigel Turner, who produced it later, became president of the BBC. But they called me and they said this was the 25th anniversary. And they wanted to get, and people were dying off, so they wanted to get as many eyewitnesses or, or people involved, their stories as possible on film. 
so that this would be a historical record. Well, I believe in history. I believe like what the museum is doing here. I'm very much in favor of it. And I thought it sounded like a very good project. And it's being done by the BBC. And they came all the way up to well, Albany, New York. It's funny because I think they, I don't know where they thought we lived in Albany, but they called me and asked me, how could they get there? And I started to tell them they could get a rowboat and come up to Hudson. <laughs> but um, anyhow, they finally did come up to Albany. And um, had a, they spent a whole day with me. And they, it was going to be this historical thing. And I was very pleased. And I thought the BBC was the gold standard. Later on, I found out that somewhere afterwards, they got this tip about this, I don't know, the Corsican Mafia or something. And everything, my part that they'd spent a whole day was cut to a very much edited. Yeah. You're, to, on, you're on screen about two minutes. Yeah. And it's all conspiratorial yeah, yes. statements. And I just die every time I see it. Mm. Did that did that appearance, and, and, and it was so widely disseminated, is that what prompted you to really shy away from doing interviews and appearances? That was part of it, and part of it was just the fact that when I see these awful things that were written about me, like, you know, I should be kicked out of journalism, and I was a liar, and, you know, I... It, and I was very young then, and it just really hurt me because I didn't feel I had done anything that deserved that. So uh, I just kept a low profile. So when someone approaches you today in 2015, 52 years later, and says, who do you think shot the president? What do you say? Lee Harvey Oswald. No question. No, no belief in a conspiracy today? No. But, you know, first of all, I try to explain to people, I don't know about police investigations. I don't know. I mean, I just can tell you what I saw and be 100% accurate about. I can't give you a theory on Lee Harvey Oswald or anybody else and expect it to be absolute gospel. I can tell you what I think mm -hmm. if you want to hear it, but I'm not passing off that I'm the ultimate judgment on that because that's just what I feel, and, but I know what I saw. Right. Well, this wasn't the end of your connection to the Kennedy story because uh, you joined the Peace Corps the next year, which is a very important part of President Kennedy's legacy. Uh, now, one might jump to the assumption that you joined the Peace Corps in 1964 because of the assassination, but that's not correct. No, it's not correct. I had considered joining the Peace Corps as soon as I graduated, um, but it just so happened I'd gotten this offer from the Dallas Morning News three months before I graduated, and I thought, you know, just graduating to get a job with a big city newspaper, I shouldn't turn it down. Mm -hmm. So I, and also my father had some health problems at the time, and I guess I wasn't real anxious to leave the country at that point. So I took the job with the Dallas Morning News. But after this happened, I realized, you know, I really want to do something else. <clears throat> and so I, and my father was better and all that, so I just said, now's the time to do it. And the folks, uh, when you went through the Peace Corps application process, the folks that, that make these decisions were a little concerned because you had witnessed the Kennedy assassination. Yes, they were. It turned out they were very concerned. I was sent uh, to the Experiment International Living up in Vermont for training. And then they, at some point in the training, we were divided in three different groups. And one group was sent to Yale University. And um, I thought, oh, great, now I can say I've been to Yale. So uh, I then found out that the reason we were sent to Yale was because that was a head psychiatrist for the Peace Corps was at Yale. And he called me in and he says, where were you on November 22nd, 1963? Well, of course, the light bulb went right off. I know what they're thinking. So I said, I can play this game too. So I said, I was in Dallas, Texas. And he said, where were you around noontime? And I said, uh, I was standing down from the Texas School Book Depository building. And then he said, did anything happen? <laughs> and I said, oh, I thought everybody knew by now. The president was assassinated there. And then he said, are you sorry you were there? And I said, no, I'm not sorry I'm there. I'm sorry the event happened. I'm not sorry I was there. I'm a journalist, and that was one of the stories of the century, and I witnessed it. So I'm not sorry I was there. I'm sorry it happened. So he said goodbye, and that was it. And I didn't get deselected, so I guess he was satisfied. They were trying to make sure that you, you weren't feeling guilty. Yes, or and wrong. using that as, uh, you know, to oh, ease my conscience. Where were you sent when you joined? I was sent to Brazil, and I spent most of my time in Salvador, Bahia, Brazil. Tell us a little bit about that. That was towards the very beginning of the Peace Corps experience. What was uh, that like for you? Oh, the peace, that was the heyday of the Peace Corps. 
Well, <laughs> I don't know that our experience was totally um, the same as all of them. Maybe it was a little different because we had this director from California who was this most laid back person you can imagine. You know, here we arrived, these bunch of people, and they says, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And I thought he was going to tell, you know, we all thought he was going to tell us. So it was a very loose thing. And I, um, my disappointment with the Peace Corps is I didn't feel that we had accomplished what I thought we would accomplish. But then I looked at the other side of it and I said, you know, we made a lot of friends and I think we gave a really good impression of Americans to because we lived with the people. We lived in their villages or their favelas or whatever. We worked beside them. And I think they really liked us and we gave a very positive impression. And I thought, for what they paid us, we got, well, I can't remember what it was, but it was something like $100 a month. Plus we got, when we finished up, $1,200 mm -hmm. settlement. So I said, for that amount of money, I think we did a lot of good work. In your travels after the assassination, how would you be treated when people found out you were from Dallas? Oh, when I found out I was from Dallas, uh, South Americans loved, and especially Brazil, loved Kennedy. I'm sure partly because he was the first Catholic elected, but every home in that we'd go into had a picture of John F. Kennedy and Pope John the 23rd, side by side, every home. And so they'd ask me where I was from, and I just kind of, oh, I was dreaded to say I was from Dallas. And they just thought everybody from Dallas was, you know, just an evil person. So I tried to give a better impression of Dallas, and I don't know, that wasn't true of the people of Dallas. And the one thing I took to give out to people, I, uh, before I left, they had just come out with the Kennedy half dollars. So I took $20 worth of Kennedy half dollars, and as I met people, you know, I'd give them the Kennedy half dollar, which was, they thought was the greatest thing on earth. Uh, looking back now, half a century, are you glad that you participated in the Peace Corps? Well, I guess I have to be glad I met my husband there. <laughs> so, so he might not like it if I said I was sorry. But uh, uh, yes, I am glad. And I said, I think, you know, I began to look at it differently. In the, some ways, I felt very guilty feeling. I didn't think I accomplished what you think you're going to accomplish. You think you're going to do these fabulous, great things and change these lives and do wonderful things. And I don't know that we did that. I think the Peace Corps may do more of that now because they've totally switched. Now they're looking for people who have skills. In those days, they believed anyone that had a college degree could just do anything. Well, it turns out you can't and especially not in a country that's not developed and, you know, they don't have the agriculture means or the health means or anything. You can't do it with a BA degree in English literature, you know. So anyhow, I don't know that in those early days we accomplished really great things, but I think we did give a really good impression of Americans, mm -hmm. and they liked us. And so I think for what they paid us, it was worth it. <laughs> and now I think they do much more specific work. If you have questions for Mary Pillsworth, if you'll fill out your cards and pass them to the end of your rows, we'll collect those now and go through as many as we can. Now, now Mary, a couple years ago at the 50th anniversary, you came back to Dallas. This wonderful picture was taken by Andy Jacobson of the Dallas Morning News. You actually did a news story, a reflective piece in the Morning News, yes. and, and you were here for the commemorative ceremony right. in Dealey Plaza. What was that like, an eyewitness returning here 50 years to the day later? Well, I was very happy to see how how the museum was operating, how the whole thing had been treated, because I think it was so important that we remember this. I just I'm a I just think you have to remember it, and um, I I was happy the way it was being handled. When you come to Dealey Plaza on a day like today, you're here, you're in the Texas School Book Depository. Considering your connection to this event, how does it make you feel? Well, I think there's always, like the first minute I walked in this morning, it just hits you with this kind of pang of sadness and thinking of what happened here. But then I look around and I say, I'm so happy this museum is here. And I'm, I'm happy. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw the crowds here this morning. I thought 52 years later, maybe there will be 25 people there. You know, I couldn't believe the crowds that were here. So you must be doing a wonderful job. Does it surprise you that there is this relevance today uh, about the assassination? I guess it's sort of, yes. Because, I mean, I'm sure most of these people here probably are not even born when it happened. Mm. Uh, 
President Kennedy, of course, has his, a legacy all its own. We were talking before the program today about why he has such appeal all these years later. People who, as you say, were not alive during his presidency consider him their favorite American president. Where do you think that appeal, as a Kennedy kid, where do you think that appeal comes from? Well, he was just so young and vibrant. And he also, he, he was very well spoken. Uh, and he just had a way of reaching people, I think, and, and I think the, the youth factor really played a big, big part in it, too. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you remember I started out as a Stevenson person, so right. I, uh, I mean, although I respected him and I liked him, but uh, yeah. the first time in the nomination I was for Stevenson. Do you remember where you were when you first saw the Abraham Zapruder film? Uh, you know, I really... I really don't, to be honest, because I, it was a long time. I didn't see it for many, many years because I left um, the country for two years, not that long afterwards. Then I moved up to New York, and I just, so it was a long time before I saw it. And knowing now how, how famous that film is, one of the most famous films of the 20th century, you're in that film. Does that, is that a, is that a, can, apart from the tragedy of that day, is that a point of pride that you're part of that? Well, I don't, I, I don't know if pride is the word. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sorry I'm there, and I'm glad it's recorded since I was there. I'm glad there is something that shows it. I'm not sure pride is the word, but... <laughs> there are some interesting questions here today. On a scale of 1 to 10, how cute was President Kennedy? <laughs> 12. <laughs> Very good. Um, is there any Kennedy assassination researcher that you think is okay? Um, oh dear, isn't that awful? I'm getting so old I can't remember the names. Um, there was one book, I, gosh, I'm sorry, I can't think. Um, I'm not, no, I can't give a name because I can't think of that one guy's okay. name. Uh, we have a, a question here wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about specifically the head wound, if you remember the way the president's head reacted or where the shot hit the president, that, that's such an important point for researchers. Well, I just remember, oh, it's, it's such an awful way to describe it, but I just remember the head blowing open, and that's why I said he's not alive. You know, I kept telling my friends, he's not alive. He can't be alive. So... Um, uh, we heard Ann Atterbury mention that there was a pause in the motorcade as it before it sped up. Yes, that's something that, that. Oh yes, and I've written about that, and that's the other thing that's gotten me in trouble sometimes. That conspiracy theorists really like to quote, but it did seem to me that it didn't speed up like it should have. The other thing, uh, the Secret Service guy ran up to it, and the car it um, he had of course push her back in, and it just seemed to take what seemed like then forever for it to really get out of there. I kept thinking, when's it going to move? And I think I did mention in my article, and I mentioned in other conversations, that it seemed an exceptionally long time. I would have thought that um, Secret Service people would have been more trained to get out of the way quicker. Hmm. But, I mean, that's just I, a personal opinion. Uh, have you ever been threatened or harassed by anyone about what you've written? No. Okay. No phone calls in the dead of night or anything no. like that? No. Okay. And I'm not one of those many who've had mysterious deaths. Well, no, no. You're, you're here today, which yes. is proof that that did not occur. Uh, I have a question here asking if you can talk a little bit about Ted Dealey, who was the very conservative publisher at the Dallas Morning News, your boss, essentially, at the very top. <laughs> well, I mean, he was so far from me. I didn't have much dealing with Ted Dealey. The main thing I remember about Ted Dealey is, is he used to come and bring his dogs. He used to come to work, and the chauffeur would come with the dogs and bring up. I didn't really know Mr. Dealey at all. I didn't reach that high. In the uh, when you would, would turn to the editorial page and read some of the material that was in there at that time, would it make you angry? Yeah, it sort of did, yeah. Uh, I have a question here wanting to know about the rest of your weekend, where you were when Oswald was shot and that sort of well, thing. Well, okay, I, I stayed at the newspaper that night very late, probably midnight or so, because there, all these reporters had gathered from all over the world there, and a lot of them were Spanish-speaking, and I stayed and helped the people from Spanish-speaking newspapers and stayed on until about midnight. The next morning, 
I want, want my mother had I called my mother right after I wrote that story from the newspaper I called my mother and as soon as she picked up the phone she said you were there weren't you she knew I had been there she no. just knew it because so anyhow my mother was as upset as I was so I went home for the week which is down in Mahia Texas I went home uh, for the weekend and I was we were watching on TV on Sunday when Oswald was shot then I came back Sunday night stopped at the newspaper Sunday evening and all the excitement was just so big because there was this fabulous picture that the uh, uh, photographer had taken of, uh, of uh, Ruby shooting Jack Beer's photo Jack, of yeah, the, Jack Beer's photo, and we all said Pulitzer Prize, Pulitzer Prize, Pulitzer Prize, and then the next morning, the next afternoon, the other paper came out with the picture that must have been taken what a hundredth of a second later, six where he hit, of a second, yeah. and it got the Pulitzer Prize, and and you know that second that picture that we thought was for sure the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. Uh, the picture of you on the phone in 1961 to Cuba was taken also by Jack Beers. Yeah. Uh, did you know Jack well? No, not well. I mean, you know, I, I certainly knew him because he did a lot of our photography. But. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question here asking what other national conventions you attended besides the one in Los Angeles in 60. Well, that's the only national convention I attended, but I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to attend the one this year in Philadelphia. Okay. We'll, we'll have to see if you are able to do that. I hope you are. I hope so, too. Uh, our last question today, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up the program. As a reporter, how did you collect yourself and your thoughts uh, to write that story that afternoon? Did you recognize at the time that you were recording one of the first draft of history moments uh, at the time? Well, um, I don't know. I just did what I had to do. Um, I don't remember anything more than just, just that. I was told to do it. They put me in a room all by myself, so I guess I didn't have any, you know, distractions, and they closed me up in this room. After your tranquilizer. Yeah, after my tranquilizer. <laughs> and, and I wrote the story. And uh, Now, you've seen journalism change a great deal. I, I'd like for the last question, uh, tell me about the role of women in journalism and how that has evolved since you were writing those Penny Watcher articles in 1961. Oh, well, I mean, you know, I, I always said all my life, I was just born 10 years too soon, you know, because, in fact, my father wanted me to be a lawyer, and I thought about being a lawyer, and then I thought, what's a woman going to do as a lawyer? She's going to, you know, be somebody's law clerk or something. So I went into journalism, but it was still that way with women in journalism. You know, you went to the women's news. I think there were two women uh, in the uh, regular news section mm -hmm. at that time, and there were 20-some-odd of us in this room writing all this stuff. But it began to change not too long after that, you know, within 10 years. I said, really, I, I was born 10 years too soon in a way, but... Um, well, it has been a, a pleasure to have you here to share your story with us. Please join me in thanking Mary Pillsworth for being here. Thank you.